Hello. Today I want to go through a run through for how to run STM Toolbox uh, to perform max and modeling. And this is a sort of starting with raw coordinate data and climate files, and we're going to go through the process of creating all the things you need to create a high quality distribution model. All right. So first, go to stmtoolbox.org. So go ahead and type that in here. Uh, I'm already there, but there's the website. And once you get there, go ahead and go to the download section. And the thing STM Toolbox needs is it's an ArcGIS plugin, so you need some form of ArcGIS, ArcMap. And so it functions on ArcMap 10, and there's a bunch of different versions that fit that. And then just recently we've released an ArcGIS Pro version. And so select one that fits your current installation. I currently have ArcGIS uh, ArcMap 10.5 installed on my computer, so I'm going to download that one. And so go ahead and let it download. And when you're done, go to the folder where it's downloaded, and then unzip the file and place it somewhere. I'm going to put it on the desktop. So I just did that, and so now I have a folder that looks like this. And so I have the toolbox, uh, some scripts, and a readme file. So now I need you to go to, let me just close a couple things out. I'm going to close ArcGIS map. And so you need to close everything out, uh, any ArcGIS uh, things like ArcScene, Arc Catalog, ArcMap, I close them all out and start fresh for in the installation. All right, so now I, you just need to open Arc Catalog. So I'm going to, give me one second to get that pulled up. And so I'm clip, clipping on it. It's going to take a second to pull up. And again, I have no other ArcGIS program running, just ArcGIS Arc Catalog. And after you install this, uh, this STM Toolbox will always be available when you open ArcMap. All right. So Arc Catalog has opened now. So let's just center that so we can see it. Your catalog sh should look something like this. Um, let's just minimize that. And so what we have here is you should see some window corresponding to the toolbox. If you don't, you should have a menu. Click that. And that will pull it up. Here I already have it there. Okay, you'll see that I already also have STM Toolbox installed. So I'm just going to remove that. Right click and remove it so we can I can show how it's installed. All right, so now to install it, you just right-click any of the white area in the toolbox area and sit Add Toolbox. So I unzip mine to the desktop, and so here we are. And I'm just going to add it from there. And in just a second, STM Toolbox will show up. And to, to finish installing, we just close this window out. And now it's installed. And so now you can open ArcMap. I, I just want to do a couple things here uh, to finish the installation and get everything ready for the first use. Okay, so the ArcGIS has opened now. I'm going to just close this out. And sh you should see now a bunch of cool uh, toolboxes. If you don't, again, visualize that by touching that. Let me center up my map. And now you should see uh, STM Toolbox appear. And the version, it should be the latest version. The version as of recording is version 2.4. All right, there's a couple things you need to do to finish the installation. So you go to Customize and go to Extensions. And so go to this and make sure 3D Analyst, Geostatistical Analyst, and Spatial Analyst are ticked. Uh, th these are required for STM Toolbox to function properly. So if you don't have license to these, uh, some of STM Toolbox work, but uh, others will not. And so now we have installed it. It's, it's basically ready for us to go. Uh, I'm going to minimize this just for a second because I want to go back to the website and talk about uh, sort of the, the 12 commandments of STM Toolbox. All right, so to get to those, if you ever need to, uh, they're on the contacts page. So let me just center that. 
All right, so the first one is do not include spaces in path or file names. And this is a really important one. This is a very common mistake people make. Uh, this is entirely for the Python scripting. If you have a, a space in the file name or the path, it basically will break a, a Python script. So do not do that. Uh, ArcGIS will function just fine, but when you incorporate Python scripting into that, uh, it will break uh, associated analysis. The second one, equally important, is avoid non-alphanumeric characters in file names, headings, and table values. And so this is like an asterisk, uh, greater than, less than, equals, plus, and so on. Just check these out. These also will break any Python script. They, they can be misinterpreted as uh, syntax rather than a character. And so just avoid these altogether. This is generally a good recommendation for any uh, computational analysis, not just STM toolbox. All right, the other thing, uh, this is another thing people often have issues with is you need to have your, your maps projected and also the projection defined. And so you need to know what that is. And, and if you don't know that, uh, you have to look into the metadata for many of these things. And so again, all the input data need to be properly projected, and they also need to be in the same projection. Now, you're going to run just some headaches. This is a general good rule, again, for GIS. So get good at this. It will reward you elsewhere. Number four is make sure spatial analyst extension is turned on. We just did this. So that, that I just showed you how to do that. Number five is limit table headings to 12 or fewer characters. When you have shapefiles in ArcGIS, uh, Basically, there's columns that correspond to data associated with each locality, or polygon. It, if, the, if the column headers are greater than 12 characters, often uh, they'll be truncated during analysis. And so and this will screw up some of the scripts. So if you're having issues with something, go check your, the headings for a lot of the, the focal shapefiles input, and it might be that your column headings are way too large. So reduce them down to 12. Six is pretty uh, explanatory. Do not install an alternative version of Python. Yeah, this will mess things up, so don't do that. Seven, have an appropriate ArcGIS license. For full functionality, ArcMap must be the standard advanced license level with access to Spatial Analyst extension. Uh, we discussed that a little bit uh, when we I showed you how to do number four. Eight is when something doesn't work, Go ahead and try the example data, and, and let me just pull that folder up. Uh, toolbox, and so there's, let me just pull this up, minimize this, and we'll come back to this just a second. And so if you look at the, the headings for STM Toolbox, there's a folder that corresponds to those. And so let's just do, for the STM Tool ones, there's one folder. It turns out the universal and uh, Maxent ones the file inputs are, are very similar, RL has specified. But yeah, so you, let's see, create, let's do rarify. So I could go to that folder, and then these are the inputs you'd need for rarify. So if you went to Universal Tools, uh, spatially rarify occurrence data, these are the example files you would need to run step one successfully. And all of the, the example data are sort of ordered in this way. All right, oh, let's pull up, excuse me, let's pull up the 12 commandments again. So try that. Uh, if, if, you, if the example data work, but yours do not, it means the inputs of yours are, are likely off. The next step is once you have an error, how to interpret it. It turns out that the red text in error boxes, uh, all of this is ArcGIS's uh, error messages. It doesn't, off, often this, this means nothing to me and doesn't help me troubleshoot what's going on. However, I have created my own error messages embedded in the text that will often tell you. And so if you go above the red text, you'll see STM Toolbox's error messages, if there is one. And this one says, projection in unknown, please define the projection and buy one. And it wouldn't be highlighted like this, it'd be in normal text. Okay. Uh, another couple things is when a tool fails, do not rerun the analysis without uh, deleting all files in the output folder or changing to a new output folder. So basically, if it airs out and you leave all the garbage in that folder, this could mess it up even more. So even if you fix what the problem was, the presence of all these other files existing might uh, further complicate things. So just clean the folder out or get a new folder. 
Lastly, if working on a network drive, uh, often it will work perfectly with network drives, but if you're running into issues, uh, I, I've had this in my classes, if you move all the files to a local drive, this will fix a lot of the headaches. Try that before uh, contacting. And then, so 12 is just, I ask you to go through these things, and then provide detailed information regarding these problems, including screenshots of errors and information regarding input data. Without this, I, I really can't help you. And so there's a Google group that you could go to here uh, that will, where there's a big community of people that will help you, or email this email address. Again, uh, just the last bit is I, I receive a lot of emails are regarding STM Toolbox. Lately, I've only been responding to topics directly related to the function of STM Toolbox. Uh, thus, if you have any questions regarding general modeling or theory, I, I'm just, I don't have time to respond to all these. So go to either the Mac Center or the STM Toolbox Google Groups and, and get your, ask your questions there. I, I appreciate that. And lastly, uh, if you like and use STM Toolbox, please follow us on Twitter. Uh, there I post news about updates and anything. Okay. So that's that. Let's center this in the, the camera. Here we are. And so when you open this up, all right. So you're, you should, uh, if you don't see the toolbox, your, your window should look something like this. So uh, if you don't have the toolbox window available, go ahead and click that and put that and resize it to about this size. All right, so now you can explore it. So you should see something like this. And so you're going to have uh, this tree, open STM toolbox, there's a bunch of options. All right, so now we need to, uh, well, let's start modeling. So the first step is we need to get some climate data. Now let's go here. I'm going to use climate from paleoclimb.org. So let's just go there, www.paleoclimb.org. Uh, for those who are working in the neotropics, uh, it turns out that the precipitation of uh, the Chelsea data set, which I'm going to download here, is I think is much higher quality than the, the more widely used world climb. So just uh, check it out, compare the two, and see what best uh, fits your personal knowledge or uh, rain atlases and so on. And so for this one, we're going to download the 2.5 arc minute current data set. So I'm just going to download that. Uh, this will take a couple minutes. Uh, one reason to download from paleoclimb.org is that the, the file names are all consistent with the, uh, all the other files on paleoclimb.org. So we have a lot of paleoclimate uh, files for projecting. Once you build your model on the current climate, you can actually put it into past climates to understand how uh, distributions may have changed. All right, but yeah, so so the data, the Chelsea data on paleoclimb.org are all the same file name structure, consists with these other ones. They're also, uh, you can download all the files in a single clip or click. And so on Chelsea, Chelsea's own web page, you have to download each one individually. All right, so I'm going to go open that file up and, and unzip it. And so here we are, I'm just going to drag this to the desktop. And so I had a pre-existing folder there, so we're going to see what's going on. All right, so now I've, I should, you should have a folder of climate data. Let me just, and so here, and so one thing, uh, I just opened it up. They're all TIFF files. I'm going to close this out. Uh, we can now minimize our web browser. We now have our climate data. We have uh, STM Toolbox. And now, uh, if you haven't downloaded the example data, you should go ahead and do that because we need this for the rest of the tutorial. So go ahead and download that if you haven't. And then unzip that. And so I'm doing that right now. All right, so here I just overwrote it, but here it's on the desktop. So now we have these three files. So now we, I'm going to minimize that. And so we're going to begin working with clipping our, our we're going to start with the climate data. That's the first step. So let's go to wherever you unzip that. Mine's on my desktop. And so it's 2.5 minute, arc minute data. I'm just going to add one of those to show you what it looks like. So here we are. This is a, a global level climate layer. Uh, this is annual temperature. I just visualize it. it gives you, oh, let's invert that so it makes sense. Here's the warmer, colder, and so on. And so today we're actually going to be working on a data set that contains two chameleons. 
from Madagascar. So it doesn't really make sense to be doing our analysis at a global level scale. So the first step we need to do is clip our climate data down to the same extent. And so one note, while, while the computer's responding, if you're going to do this for multiple data, so, so here we're just going to use the CHELSA climate bioclimate variables, but say you had soil data or, or some other human influence, put those all in the same folder and, and clip them at the same time. And this, this only works if they're all the same projection and same resolution, else you have to do additional steps and SDM Toolbox can help you with that. And so if you're going to do that, go ahead and check out the user guide. It will it'll help you get everything in the same resolution. But today we're just going to do it with the bioclimbs. All right, so we're, the, so we're going to go open, start expanding STM Tool Box. You go to Basic Tools, expand that, Raster Tools, and then it's going to balloon into a bunch of tools. We actually want the very first one in that list. And so you, when you open this up, yours might not look like this. For most people, when you first open it, it looks something like this. And so what I want you to do is click Show Help, and then stretch the window wide enough so that covers most of the screen. And then yours, again, will probably, let's just get this, will look something like this. Uh, I want you to widen it so the help window, you can see the total width of the, the images. This, will, this is here to help you. Uh, and so often you can, this tells you all about the tool, but if you have questions about the input, it will tell you here. Uh, so right here. And so just click on the box and it will, it will highlight it there. All right, so let's start running this tool. So let's go to that input folder. Uh, you always have to step up one to select the folder. So go back to, this is on my desktop, so I went to my desktop, highlighted it. The next step while we're letting that load is it asks, are the inputs S3 grids? They're actually geotiffs, and, and you can go there, look at the file format. Uh, if it has the extension .tiff, that's what it is. S3 grids are basically a folder containing the rasters. And so these are not, so we're going to leave these unmarked. We're going to let this respond. And again, uh, while this is waiting, look at, look at my file name, and you can see that there are no spaces anywhere. So if you have a space, say, I had my full name, Jason Brown, and there's a space between that, that would cause errors. So be cognizant of that. All right, so let's create an output folder. I'm on my desktop. Uh, let's go to Climate Clipped. Uh, I just made this... Uh, a moment ago, if you don't have that, you can, let me show you, you can actually just click this button, create a new folder, rename it, and then select it. Okay, so there we go, there's that. Uh, the extent, that's a good question. So here you can, if you have a shapefile of the, the extent, a country mask, you can go ahead and select that here. We're going to use extent, and so let's just drag this off window for a second. So we're really interested in just clipping this down to Madagascar, so I'm going to zoom into Madagascar. All right, and so we're going to look at this. And so what you're going to do is so get a, pe a pen and paper, and you're going to write down four numbers. Uh, we're basically going to select a box around the area you want to clip. And so I'm going to pick right here, and if you look, oh, let me get this thing out of the way, you can see that in the bottom right-hand corner, it tells you the coordinates of where your cursor is. And so this is just approximation, so we're going to, I'm going to just do this right here uh, for the top left. I'm going to write that value down. And, all right, so it, it says 42.6 for right. For the top value, it's negative 10.85. And then we're going to go in the bottom right-hand corner of where we want to clip. So everything inside of that is going to be kept. And let's just let my computer respond. All right, it's done. And so I'm in the bottom right-hand corner, I'm going to write that down. So here we have the, sorry, the, I misspoke. The top one is the left and top value, not the, the right. Looking at my right. And so here in the bottom, it's, uh, the bottom corner is going to be 51.69. And that's to the right. And then uh, the latitude is going to be negative 25.62, and that's the bottom. All right, so let's go back to our tool. Uh, so drag that back up, and you could do this ahead of time. We're going to go to the extent. We're not going to use a mask. We're going to clip the climate by extent. 
So as specified below, and so we're just going to actually put in those numbers. And just do a convention, it's better to start with the right and the bottom. Uh, I, I, basically, if the values are negative, it'll switch these two. Uh, anyway, just trust me, start bottom and right. So we're going to do negative 25.6. And then for the right, we're going to have 51.69. So these are the last two numbers I wrote down. And for the top, we're going to have negative 10.85. Okay, so there we have 10.85. And then on the left, uh, we have put 42.6. We're, we're ready. So we could run this now and it would output something. But we actually want to click the additional parameters. And it's going to save us a step. We're going to... Uh, I didn't mean to put, just have this, leave this as maximum inputs. I want you to go to output raster type and select ASCII file. So this is a format which Maxent needs. And so select that, and then also leave this as true, scrub ASCII headers. So, and tick that. And once you have this set up like this, you can go ahead and go. And so here you'll see a visualization of what's going on. Uh, in the analysis, it should be telling you what's going on. So basically it's walking to the folder and finding all that TIFF files and clipping it to that extent. And then now we've moved from clipping and it's actually converting the, the TIFF format to an ASCII format. It's just wrapping up. Sometimes it will time out like that. Okay, we're done, so we can just close that out. It looks like everything went well. Uh, if it didn't, there would be an error message and something would pop up and say, oh no, and then we'd sort that out. But all is well here. So we're going to close this out and then move to the next step. Okay, so we've now clipped. Let's actually show, look at some of that to make sure it looks good. So let's go to our desktop. Clipped climate is the output folder I selected. So let's just put by one on there. It's say on no spatial reference. That's okay. We'll fix that in a minute. And voila, we now have just, I'm going to, from Madagascar versus all of the globe. So we did it. And it looks good. So now we uh, this will speed up a lot of the, the process. Next, we need to define the projection. You, you saw when I loaded that, it said uh, projection unknown. So we then keep the raster tools right here. We're going to go down the menu and go define projection as WGS folder. So we're going to go to tool 3D. Double click that and go to your output folder. And you, you're probably asking, well, how do I know that? That's what it is. Well, that, that's what the uh, input climate data we're at. If you don't know this, uh, you don't want to use this tool if it's not WGS 1984. Turns out a majority of them are. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and run this tool very quickly, and it's going to define the projection. So, and just give it a minute. And so one important thing to clarify is that this is not changing the projection. This is just labeling the projection. Uh, there's a lot of confusion between... Uh, projecting or changing your datum to a new format and defining the pro projection. This is basically taking the file format, say it's an apple, and it's, it's labeling that it's an apple. It's not changing it to a different projection. So, all right, so that is done. So now we've our projection defined. Whoops. So now we've clipped the climate data and defined the projection. We're, in, we're ready to go to the next step. Um, let's put our, we're going to take our input locality data. And so here, uh, I'm assuming that you've vetted, you have high quality spatial data, data that's vetted for accuracy. And you're going to incorporate that to here. Uh, that's the situation with the data that we're going to use next. So before we can verify, we, we first, uh, the next step we're going to do is spatially verify the data. And before we can do that, we actually have to import the, the file into here. So if you go to your example data, and so you, let me just, I was already there. So here's the base folder. You open that up, go to SEM analysis, maxent modeling, you select that folder. And these are the occurrence points. Let me just open that up to show you what they look like. Uh, we are then going to import that into ArcGIS and make a shape file out of it so we can spatially verify. Process the occurrence data. So we've dealt with the climate data to some degree. Uh, so we go to this folder, and let's see if I can get this to open. For some reason it's not. Okay. 
That's not the right. Okay, here we go. Excel is being weird. Okay, so you should have a file that looks like this, where it's basically in the default max and form word species, longitude and latitude. One thing I want to note that uh, I was very careful in the, the file names, that I prefer not to have spaces, so a search and replace spaces with underscores. That will. And so let's go ahead and put these into the GIS and visualize them. So I, let's just close that out. Um, all right, so let's open that file. And so you can use, there's actually a tool in the basic tools, if depending on your level of ArcGIS experience. Uh, if you're experienced, you won't need this, uh, but let's use it. So let's input, it converts a, a text document to CSV file to a shape file. So let's just use that here. That way everyone can follow along. So let's go to the example data folder and let's go find that file. So STM analysis, maxent modeling, occurrence points, yay. And then we go and select the column that goes to longitude or the X value, the latitude or the Y value. Name a new file. Let's put points for verifying. Point. So I'm creating a new folder on the desktop called Point Data. So let's make sure that's selected. Add that. And let me pull the tool window up so you can see me click go. All right, so this all looks good, so I'm going to let it run. And it's done. And so now we can go to that and put the, already put them on the map, so I'm just going to zoom to that so you can see it. And there we go. We have our occurrence data. All right, so now we're ready to do the next step, is, which is to rarify the points. And so uh, the PDF, uh, there's a PDF in the uh, linked below. Go ahead and check that out. It gives a bunch of citations of why this is important. But the, the fundamental main point is that you don't want spatial biases incorporated into your model building. And so, for example, let's say you had a really tight cluster of points at one site and then sort of evenly sampling elsewhere. You're upweighting the climate if you if you don't deal with that in that cluster of points and saying that climate there is more important in your model than elsewhere, and thus the need for spatial rarifying. Let's go back up to so SDM tools, universal tools, spatial rarify occurrence data, spatially rarify. So take number one from that tool. That's all we're going to need today. So we now take our new point file. Here it is. We put the species field, that's the first column, latitude field, longitude field, uh, output folder. I will create a new folder. I'm going to call that rarified points. Here we are. Oops. Got to make sure. Sometimes it, it, the name below stays as the new folder. So, All right, so I, I can confirm I have that. And notice I, for the underscore, I instead of a space, I put an underscore. Output name, uh, these are chameleons, so I'm just going to put chams, for short for chameleons. And so one thing on the output name is right here, the STM toolbox window will tell you that underscore rarefied points will be appended. So I don't need to put that. So the output actually file will be chams, or chameleons, underscore rarefied points. Uh, the res resolution rarify, we're going to do 20 kilometers today. Uh, you should read the literature. It, uh, you can justify, there's lots of reasons that people justify between 5 and 40 kilometers. Here, I think 20 is a great. And then the last step is to choose an equidistance projection that matches the area where you're, you're doing the analysis. To do that, we just pull down the tab and you pick the one that's appropriate. So here, we're in Madagascar, which is Africa. And it, so first go to the continental one if you're doing it at a continental scale. Pick a world one. And so the world ones are basically in the order of suggestion. Uh, you can read all about this right over here. 
But today we're going to use the Africa Equidistance Quantical. And we're not going to do any of the optional parameters. We're going to just do it at a single distance. And we're going to hit OK. So we're ready to go. So we're just going to And so it basically went through, it says 126 points input. There were zero duplicates, so I was very uh, studious and made sure there were no duplicates, but if you have them, no biggie, it will remove them. It's removing duplicates by having exact same Latin long coordinate associated with each species name. It then does uh, spatial rarifying based on the distance. Here it removed 126, or it removed 26 points of the 126. So our final data set is 100 unique occurrence points. And then, so it projects this in the equal distant projection. You want that so you're measuring distance between the points. It actually means something spatially. And then the script will then put it back into its original WGS 1984 projection. Again, if your data are not in that WGS 1984 projection, you need to have them for this to work properly. So I'm just going to close that. All right. So we close that out, and we are ready. So now, I just want to compare. So let's make these white so they're easier to see. So here, you can see the dark points are the ones that have been removed. And so you'll see there's clusters. So if we zoom into here, let me make this less contrasty. Ugh, that didn't help. <laughs> here we go. And so you'll see that the points uh, input, the red ones were removed because they're spatially redundant with the white ones. And so here, th these ones were removed because they were clustered at greater than or less than 20 kilometers. So here you can see this makes sense. You're sort of smoothing out. Okay. So one, one no note on this process is that it's, it's based on the way it calculates is based on a distance matrix, and it's, there's no randomness to it. You'll always get the same output based on the order of the points put in. And so uh, if you do this 10 times, every time your output will look like this. And so just keep that in mind. Some people uh, would like to have a subset of that. All right, so we now have our, our, our data set ready, looking like that. We are ready to the next step. And so we have our, our occurrence localities processed for modeling. We have our climate data trimmed. We next need to create something called a bias file. And the bias file is important for multiple reasons. Uh, it basically scales down areas from which background points are taken. And this is really important in model tuning. And uh, again, check the, the user guide that's linked below. This will explain in detail some citations for it. But basically, if you leave the entire area for model tuning, it, there, it turns out that as you get further away from the localities of known distribution, uh, there's a, a high chance of highly suitable habitat to exist, but that could not be colonized. And so when this is left in the tuning process, it basically picks a model that's slightly more complicated when these areas are, are included in the analysis. And you're, you can end up with an overparameterized model. Again, check the, the two PDFs for a detailed discussion of that. Okay, so we're, we're going to create this bias file so that we, we uh, basically have the best model we can. To do that, we then go to modeling with MaxEnt. So SDM tools, MaxEnt tools, background selection by bias files, and today we're going to use the buffer, no, we're going to do, is, uh, sorry, sample by buffered minimum convex polygon. So it's the third one in the list. We're going to double click that, and we're going to create this. And so here's the schematic kind of shows what it is. So we have Madagascar input, and output is going to be, the bias file is going to create something like this. So it's only going to create background points in, for building, uh, tuning the model, from this area. So all these areas in the black will not be used to, to tune the model. Again, this is to minimize model overfitting. All right, so species occurrence table. So we have, we're going to go to rarefied points. So we're going to go ahead and select our rarefied points. 
and so just input the CSV. Don't take the shape. I'll do the CSV file, and again specify the appropriate fields. And so I, I didn't specify, but when you rarify it, I'll put the shape file of the points. That's what's on the map, but I also put the CSV file, and this is what Maxin is going to use. So let's just use that here. And then buffer distance, we're going to select kilometers, and we're going to put 200 kilometers. This is a good starting point. Uh, you basically want something, a distance that is like through very brief evolutionary times a species could disperse in. It may not be in the single individual's lifetime, but say a couple individuals, what their maximal dispersal potential is. And you may not know this, so you're going to have to guess a little bit. Uh, uh, in terms of guessing, it's better to be slightly bigger than uh, smaller. And say, so we're doing chameleons, I'm going to say 200, 200 to 100 is a good range. But say for, say you were doing something in elephants, you probably want 1,000 to 2,000 kilometers. Okay, you get the point. So it's uh, 200 kilometers is our buffer distance. And we're going to create an output folder. I'm going to go to the desktop and create that. Uh, bias file, I'm going to create, that's what it's going to be called. So I'm going to reselect that to make sure it's, going to add that. The output folder. Okay, so you then need to select one of these climate files uh, as a template for the analysis extent. So I'm going to go to climate clipped and go on and pick just bio one. It could be any of these. I'm using bio one today. And now we're ready to create a bias file. And so the, it will run through this. And it's going to, so all of these scripts are, are aimed to handle multiple species at, at once. So when it rarified it, it would rarify localities per species based on the input distance. And so you could have 200 species or one species, but the script, you have to click it once and it will create all the associated files. Uh, here we have a file with two species, so it's going to go through and do it twice. And so same with the sample by buffered minimum complex polygon, which is creating the bias file. This will create uh, two files corresponding to each species. And so here it's just telling us uh, Oscilletti and Paradalis are the two species. And it says it's done. So let's just look at those quickly. So let's add one of those here. So go to the go to wherever you put this. I'm, again, mine's on bias file. Now let's put both of them on here. So add them to the map. And you'll see something like that. Uh, let's just turn off Oscillati because he has some. And let's just make, I just want to show you what that looks like. So let's turn the points, so they're categories, and let's only see, let's add all the values. And then let's do Paradalis only. So I'm going to remove Oscilletti and then turn off all their values. So I just want to show you what this looks like. So let me convert this to a little bit better point color. All right, so you can see here this is the bias file for this chameleon. And so these are the input points, and then created a minimum convex polygon around them, and then put a buffer. And so the, only will these client, the, the models be trained with background points from this climate. And everything excluded from this will not be used at this, this step. It will be used when you build your final model and sort of project it into the total climate space. But for model tuning, uh, it's ignored. That's good. All right, so we have our bias files now. So now we have three things, and we're actually ready to do the big step. We are ready to model. And so those the three things are done. We've clipped our climate to the right extent, we've rarified our points, and then we've created bias files. So now we can go to Maxent, modeling with Maxent, we can click this. And this is the big daddy. This uh, And so if you don't have it, you have to actually go and download Maxent file, and here in this window it tells you where. So go to this link, you go ahead and pause the video if you don't have this, and download this. Uh, unzip it and put it on your, your desktop. Uh, I will do the same. All right, so back, uh, so now you should have downloaded and unzipped it, and it should be on a folder. You can go ahead and select that. So I'm going to go to my desktop, that's where it's sitting. And I'm going to go down to Maxent. I'm going to open that up, and you're going to select the jar file. And we're now going to go to fill and populate all these layers uh, based on your input. And so again, this, this help window tells you a lot about the process. 
and you can see here it's sort of a visual guide to it also. So let's take the species occurrence table. This is your rarefied points. So go to desktop, rarefied points, select the CSV file, not the shape file, and then populate the corresponding fields. Here they perfectly match what it's asking for. So species, launch and lantern, these all come from that table. We then select our environmental folder. So I'm going to go to desktop, clipped climate, and there we go. Uh, if you have any categorical layers, you want to select them here. These are all continuous variables, so we don't. But if you have something like vegetation or geology, uh, go ahead and, and put them here so that Maxon can use them appropriately. We don't have anything there, so that's okay. We then uh, layers in our environmental data folder to exclude. Uh, I don't actually have anything I want to exclude there, but you could. We then, you can go to the bias files. And so what, one comment on this, uh, so you may actually want to only include uncorrelated or, or lower correlation variables. And so STM Toolbox has a tool for this, uh, just to point it out. And then here you could exclude those files and to keep only the ones you want. And so you could, you could go to Universal Tools, Explore Climate Data, Remove Highly Correlated Variables. In this tool, you just input all those layers. Let's, let's just do it since we're having fun. So let's go to our clip climate. Let's select all of those and put them in here. And then these are the, you can input a different types of correlation level. The no data values, uh, you should know these. This, here it's negative 999. And then you put an output folder. And this will actually tell you how correlated the variables are to. I'm going to call it ClimCore climate correlations. And so let's just run this and yeah, let's just talk about it. It's, it turns out that uh, it doesn't really affect, in my opinion, having the model over-primerized by having all the variables in. You're using a machine learning uh, algorithm which is very robust to the inclusion of co-correlated variables. Main reason I would want to do this, in my eyes, is if I'm gonna, if a majority of the reason of modeling is to understand the response variables in particular when I'm comparing it amongst several species. And so by removing co-correlated variables, you're, it's easier to interpret the results in short. And basically, uh, if you have five variables and they're highly correlated with each other, just due to slight random chance or slight nuances in the climate files, for one species, that might be the most important, whereas the other, one of the other four might be selected as most important. And then it's really difficult. You might falsely interpret that uh, those climate responses are different when they're really based on highly correlated climate variables. And so that's, this is why I would mostly do it. So let's just do this. So it actually does a pairwise list. Uh, if you have favorite climate variables, you, you put them to the top of that list because it's going to preferentially eliminate climate variables based on their order on that list. So now it's just running through, finding the correlations, and it's going to output them. It's now assessing which ones we need to remove. And so at, at point 0.6, uh, we can have the following two layers, bio 4 and bio 12. Oh, no, yeah, so bio 2, 4, 12, and 1. At point 7, it goes up to, to more. And so at point 8, we have this. And so here, as, as the value gets higher for the Pearsons are, uh, you're allowing um, lower variables of, of sort of moderate correlation to be included. All right, but yeah, so you could go ahead and remove variables. So let's just say we wanted to, let's go with 0.8. And so I'm just going to write these down quickly, but let's only keep these into our, our model. So here's bio 4, bio 3, 2, 18, 15, 13, 12, and 1. And so we're going to exclude everything that's not that. So we're going to close this to the spatial jackknifing. Again, you can skip this step entirely, so if you need to fast forward. But let's go to layers, environmental, exclude. Now let's, and so this is the tricky part. You actually have to invert. So I have a list of everything that's included. So let's go to climate, clipped, and so to exclude. And so I'm just going to do a quick list of what's going to be 
excluded. So 1, 2, and 3 are kept, so 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 are all excluded. Then 14 is the next one that's excluded. 16, 17. All right, so let's do that. Again, I got those through that previous thing and told me which ones to keep. Now I'm going through and removing those. So 10, 11, it's our mark to be removed. Uh, let's keep going. It says 14, 16, and 17. Uh, 18 is kept. 19 is excluded. And then we get to these. Uh, we exclude four. So to, to select more than one, you just hold shift. All right, so let's select. Select more than one again, you hold shift and get them. And so we actually want all of these gone. They're all highly correlated with the ones that we decided to keep. All right, so now we've removed co-correlated variables. We don't. We can leave those in the folder, and not a big deal. Uh, now you go to the folder for the bias file we created. This is on my desktop in a folder called bias file. So I'm selecting that. Here we go. This is required. Uh, it says optional or used to. It, 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 everyone needs a bias file. So even if you're doing these things at tiny extents, which will include the entire landscape, you have to create a bias file. All right, and let's create an output folder. I'm going to create a new folder. So I'm going to just name this models and put that, so let's select that. Uh, the format I'm going to leave is the default. Output file type has ASCII's. Let's create pictures. Let's toggle this, create response curves, create prediction. If you want, you can do jackknife. I'm not going to do it in this because uh, I, I want the tutorial to move at a somewhat fast pace. All right, so then we we have to input one step of our model to what our regularization multipliers we're going to use. Let's use what's suggested here in the window, 0 0.5, 1. And so you, you put in any value separated by a semicolon. 2, then I'm going to do 3, 4, and 5. All right. Actually, uh, so that's, that's what I do if I'm doing this research. We're going to, to speed it up, let's just do it these, these first three. 0 0.5, 1, and 1. Point. Let's do 2. Uh, threshold, pick your favorite threshold. I'm going to put 10 percentile training presence. It's my favorite at the moment. Uh, you should read up on which one's best. Uh, there's lots of discussion regarding that. Here you input the, any climate layers you're going to project. So folders, just corresponding folders with uh, different climate layers. It could be projecting the world for that same time period, but also just different time periods like past or future climates. Select the folders here. One important thing about that, we're not going to do that today, but the file names have to perfectly match the input climate file names for this to work. Uh, we're not actually projecting anything, so the extrapolate doesn't really matter. So, so we'll just leave that as default. You can untick it. It's not going to change. Other settings, uh, we're going to use omission error rate, then AUC. There's some, you can switch these around based on your preference, but this is generally what's broadly considered the best. Here we have two species, uh, so I'm going to actually run these on two different threads. Uh, basically, so this allows you, it's not strict multi-threading, but basically if you have more than one species, you can run uh, simultaneously instant, simu simultaneous instances of this analysis. Again, so we're going to speed this up. We're going to do both species at the same time, spreading amongst two CPUs. One uh, important clarification of this is that it, it, if you have one species and you have a lot of these parameters, you can't, it won't actually work. To, you can't put this at eight and it'll split that up. And that's because the way this script is handling your input climate folder. Uh, it basically, it has to, per species, have exclusive use of that climate folder. So it can't run a bunch of instances at once. But again, like we said, we, we want two. We're going to leave uh, these checked, independent, evaluate future classes and regularization multipliers. It's basically run, you want to tune the model. If not, it just runs at once. 
uh, disable feature, threshold feature class in Maxent. So recently they've just, for these tuning experiments, there's been some discussion that uh, threshold should be disabled. Here that's checked. So we're going to go with those recommendations. Next we have the spatial jackknifing component. This, uh, there's some parameters for that. Minimum number of recurrence points to model species distribution. Uh, this is for all of the modeling. And so if you don't have enough points to jackknife, uh, we'll talk about that in a second. Here's the minimum number of points to spatial jackknife. Here we have a 15, we'll leave it at that. Replicates of each model parameter class, we'll leave that at one number of spatial groups. It can be three or five. And then you need to decide whether you want to use spatially segregated groups. This is particularly important for projecting in different climates. Or you can use random groups. So and by random, you to, to enable random, you don't check this. And then if you have, these are the parameters for species that are not spatial jackknife, so species that have between 14 and 5 points. Uh, you can choose the replicates and the, the sort of parameters there. And we're actually ready to run this. All right. So we can go ahead and hit go. And it's going to go ahead and, so what uh, as this script is doing is basically creating all the GIS files necessary to spatial jackknife this. This is creating a bunch of GIS files uh, associated with each species modeling. It then also creates a, a bunch of batch scripts uh, in Java so that you can run this and, and do the tuning and evaluate the model and then, then make the best model. And so we're just going to let this do this here for a few minutes. And so here it's, it's identified two species, which is right. First for Ocelotti and then first for Paradalis. And it's, it's going through iteratively making, doing the, the associated analysis. So it's creating all the GIS layers needed to model. So one clarification is we are not modeling yet. We are creating all the files necessary to, to tune our models. And so here's, this is, as you'll see, a bunch of stuff flash on the screen. This is the, the Java code necessary to run Maxent. And so it's going to do that for each beta multiplier you input. And so one of the things, so it's going to output a, a two, two batch scripts. One that we're going to use to tune the models, which we're going to execute here in a minute. And the second one that actually will be, it's empty right now, but it will be populated once the best parameters are chosen. Again, we're, we're waiting, so it's iterating through the two species first. It's, it's finished with species one, now it's going to the, the second species and doing the same thing again. Awesome. And so now it's done. And so let's say, okay, important. Batch code, Python scripts, and GIS layers were successfully created for all input species. And it tells you how to do this. So uh, basically, step one, run this and wait for it to finish. Then you go to step once that's finished, you go to step two. So let's close this out, and we're going to run that. So I'm going to minimize GIS. So we're now actually done with ArcGIS, and we are just going to be running the, the batch scripts that I created. And so let's go to that folder. Um, I'll pull that in the screen here in just a second. So your folder should look something like this. It's going to have, uh, you may or may not have this third step. Here, because we're running in multiple CPUs, it, it duplicated the climate so I can run these things simultaneously. Uh, but yeah, so for all of our, no matter whether you have multi CPUs or not, uh, you're going to have step one. And I'm just going to open this to show you a little bit about this. Oops. Oh, and it's multi, let me actually close this out and show you one of these sub. Normally, if you have one CPU, this will all be nested in there, but the code will, this is just the JavaScript necessary to to tune all these models at the different parameter inputs. So let's go ahead and run that. Uh, this is all created through STM Toolbox. And the one thing that's important to know is that because the, the pathways are specific to your machine, you cannot move any of the folders with the associated files. And so we're, we're just looking at what it has to say. And so it's skipping one of these files. So you're just checking what the warnings are. So it's saying, oh, some of the files are missing climate data. That happens. So uh, don't worry about it. Uh, for many of you, uh, you might notice here again, it will put a warning, a Java warning. Uh, for some reason, Java and Windows has been playing nice lately. And so some people will get this false warning that uh, Windows and Java are not playing along. But if it continues to show all these other things, uh, everything is fine. 
But yeah, just continue to check these. If you have issues where it completely errors out and can't find a file or something, the first step to really check is make sure all your input climate data and your bias file are in the same extent, spatial extent and spatial resolution. You can do that by opening up the Maxent GUI and just importing your bias file, your climate file, and your, your occurrence localities and just running the GUI. It will error out and tell you what's not working there. So that's a good first step if you're having troubles. Right now, so we, we chose to run this on two CPUs, so it's going through and, and, and doing that. And so it's running one species model in this window and the second. And so we're just going to wait uh, for it to finish. But while we're waiting, I can show you a little bit about what it's doing. So let's just pick one of these. So here we have a three spatial groups, uh, A, B, and C, they're labeled. And so we're going to spatial jackknife, we're going to train it on two of the groups and test it with one of the groups. And so here's the train on A, B groups and test it with C. So you can go into any of these folders, you can just make sure it's working. Here, let's just go to linear, and you can see if it's making models. Uh, if it's making models, uh, everything is running as it needs. All right. And here you can just check, and oh, this is, okay, it did a model, and this, it's doing it with this. And you can just see some of the basics. Up. Again, this is a tuning phase, so this may not look like a good model, uh, and it's going through that. So it's going to run models at a bunch of different regularization types, such as linear, uh, quadratic, hinge, and so on, and looking at how those vary your model performance. And, and then it's going to repeat this for each uh, the spatial jackknife groups, and output will be a best model. And so you can actually look at some of these results. Let's step up to just paradolysis. There's going to be it's going to be creating and populating the sum stats folder. Uh, let's see if I can open that. And so yeah, so you can see that it's it's running this at these different settings. It'll put a header on once it's done, uh, but you can see it's each line is populating as a different parameter set. Let's close that out because it's actually writing to it right now. And so we're just going to wait for this to finish. And so I'm going to pause the video here for a second. And we're going to come back when it's done. We're going to do the second step. And so this is by far the longest step. This could take several days or a couple minutes. But uh, the more regularization multipliers, the higher the spatial resolution and extent of your map, the longer this is going to take. And so it's just going to iteratively evaluate all of those things and choose which parameters have the lowest omission error rate. And if there's several with the same low omission error rate, it will look at the AUC and pick the model with the highest AUC. And if there are the same, uh, there are two models or more that have the same omission error rate and the same AUC, it will look at model complexity and pick the more simple of the feature class. And that's what it's doing. So we're just going to let it uh, go and then we'll come back in just a minute. All right, so it, the analysis are wrapping up, and so just a minute, so they'll slowly disappear. If you again, it's on a single CPU of one of these windows. It will actually close itself out when it's done. Uh, if you have multiple, it will close each individual one out as they terminate. And I can see here it's wrapping up. I just I'm looking at the syntax. So in just one minute, we're going to see it close out, and then we're going to be able to run our final model. Here we go. All right, so I just want to, let's step out to the base folder models. And so in each species folder, oops, I don't want to do that. In each species folder, you can go to and look at the summary stats as their output, and then you can look at them as ranked. And so here, let's just look at this quickly. So this is just as they're written, the species, Regularization multiplier input, the feature threshold, our feature types are. This is then converted to a number for simplicity. Then you have the weighted prediction rate, which is one minus the omission error rate. So here the omission error rate is 0.4, uh, as you can see, and the AUC. Uh, so this is the, the sum stats all. So if we close that out and look at, let me, don't say that. 
look at the ranked ones, this is the best model. It's actually sorted them based on your criterion. And it's a little bit more coded here. So it turns out our best model had a regularization multiplier. It's the top row is the best model. And I'll explain why here in a second. It has a feature number five, so it's the most complex of them. It has a weighted prediction rate of 0 0.063. So this actually isn't that great of a model, uh, but again, we're using really coarse climate data. So some of that's not a surprise. So that means, uh, well, let's just figure what that out. So the emission error rate is one minus that. So let's just, so that's the emission error rate. So if you need that, uh, that's the average emission error rate amongst all the replicates. Uh, the AUC is 0 0.65, that's not so great. And then uh, this is actually another way to, to determine the best model. And so by this metric, it's actually the best too. But I really just looked at this. These were the same, so I went to the model with the best AUC, which was regularization multiplier one and that. And so it has this for both these. And that's how it's, it's sort of ranked that, pulled those out, and then populated this second batch file with the appropriate uh, code to run only the best one with all the data. So I'm going to pull that over. So I just double click that. Since those, uh, step one is done, and so if you're not sure, you can always open this in a text editor. It's running right now in the background. And here, for every species you have, there should be a line of code. And so here's one block of code, and here's the second block of code. And so I have two species, there's two lines, everything looks good. And so then we'll run that, uh, and it actually will go pretty quick, and it's already finished, I think, yep, it closed itself out. And so then we can go to the folder, and in the final folder you'll see where the models are output. Here we are, let me pull that up. So we can see how well our final model did. And so, again, this was not a great model, but that's not the point of this tutorial. It has a decent AUC uh, in the final model. Uh, but again, ideally you'd like this blue one to be above the black line. Uh, and then again, for AUC, the faster this achieves one, the, the higher discriminatory your model is, and that's usually a good thing. This is what the model, our final model looks like. Uh, to be honest, it doesn't look that bad from what I know about the species. And then we can look at the response curves. Uh, this gives you some insight into how over-parameterized or, or parameters your models are. Uh, you're, I, I generally will look at these because you don't want response curves that are, are overly complex. And so these actually don't look too bad. This is a, a sort of bell-shaped curve for temperature. That seems to make sense. About two, there's a, a sort of sigmoidal curve. And then these ones. Uh, this seems to be this, like a, these, none of these alarm me, but yeah, so it basically is really good to, uh, below a certain threshold, is, it's not good. And then after that threshold, is, it's basically okay. And so these are, you can see that, like, why would this curve, this, this would concern me, but the, we're not going to talk about this. Look at the first row of those. And then you can look at uh, percent contribution or perm permutation importance. Uh, there's, you can make arguments for either of these. Uh, permutation importance is basically it's going to permute through those and, and see how important that is overall. And so it looks like bio 17 and bio 2 of these first three are sort of uniformly the most important. So bio 2 is mean diurnal range, bio 1 is annual mean temperature, and bio 17 is precipitation of driest quarter. Okay. This is a little bit of the math. So yeah, that looks pretty good. Uh, I'm pretty happy with that. So each of, we'll have these for each of the folders. Uh, here's the ASCII file. This is the actual GIS layer associated with that. And you're going to have one of those for each species. So if we go back to the model for Ocelotti, we'll have one. The last step, uh, so we're actually done at this point. The last step of if you use multi-CPUs, you should click, you won't have this if you didn't do that, is clip, clip step three. And that will delete, it made a replicate of the climate folder. And that will delete that so you're not wasting hard drive space. And you're actually done. If you ever need to know anything about what you input in this, uh, there's a lot of STM Toolbox things have inputs. You just open this in a text editor, and it will tell you all the parameters input into this. And there we go. And so you can see when it was ran, uh, input files, what were excluded, number of processors, the criterion, and so on. So that's a good record. 
And that's it. So, so to try this again with, uh, obviously this wasn't a final run, and there were some things that were less desirable, but using this pipeline, you can model most anything. And so uh, without having to code much at all. And so that's the beauty of STM Toolbox. It provides anyone the ability to make really high quality, finely tuned models. All right, well, thank you.